Uh, I welcome you to this uh, dissertation on public defense in computer and system science. Uh, this is a special day, especially for the respondents, but also for the university. And it's also special because we have this online uh, presentation and defense. Uh, this is the first time I chair such a session and I hope everything will go well with the technology and uh, particularly the defense, of course. We have a couple of people here today that are uh, involved in the defense. It's first of all the uh, respondent, he's sitting here, it's uh, Yong Wei Li. He's uh, got a master in science in, in computer science and technology from uh, Liaoning Normal University in China in 2015. He's been an early stage researcher at the EU Marie Curie European Training Network for Full Parallax Imaging from 2016 to 2019. Also from 2019, uh, 2016, he's been a PhD student here at the Mid-Sweden University. The second uh, important person today is the uh, opponent or the faculty reviewer that will have a discussion with the respondent about his work. Uh, this is uh, Professor Paolo Favaro. He's a professor in computer vision at Bern University in Switzerland. He's the head of the computer vision group and he has a long and impressive CV uh, that I do not intend to read here. Then we also have an examination board who will decide whether uh, the, uh, the dissertation, the thesis itself and the, the presentation uh, has a quality, is good enough for a PhD. We have the, uh, the examination board consisting of uh, Professor Karl Ostrom, he's a professor in mathematics at Lund University in Sweden. He's a deputy head of the department there and he has also a very long and impressive CV. Second uh, member of the examination board is uh, Professor Jonas Unger. He is a professor in computer graphics in Linköping University, also in Sweden. He is the director of Visual Sweden's Center of Augmented Intelligence, among other positions that he has. And uh, as you guessed, he has a very long and impressive CV as well. Uh, the last member of the grading committee is Professor uh, Ulf Assasson. He's a professor in computer graphics at Chalmers Technical University in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. He's the head of the research group Graphics. And sure, he has a very long and impressive CV too. Additional persons uh, uh, involved here today is uh, the main supervisor, and that happened to be me. I'm a professor here at Mid Sweden University in signal processing. I'm the head of the research group uh, Realistic 3D. We also have the co-supervisor Roger Olson, he's online. Uh, he's got a PhD in telecommunications and he, he is a co-founder on the Realistic Research Group. So today uh, the dissertation has the following points. At first, the opponent, Professor Paolo Ferraro, uh, will give a brief introduction to the field. Uh, then the respondent, uh, Yong Wei Li, will uh, give a summary of his thesis. Uh, and then after that, uh, that will take uh, approximately one hour or a little bit less. Uh, we will take a short break and we will uh, sit, uh, uh, reassess so that we can have the defense. Thereafter, the opponent and the respondent will have a discussion about the thesis, the work that he has done. And at this point, the public uh, uh, cannot uh, pose questions. So it's, so it's just a discussion between the uh, opponent and the, the uh, respondent. Thereafter, the grading committee is uh, given the opportunity to, to uh, pose questions, uh, to supplement the questions by the opponent. Uh, and that can take as long as it takes. They are the one who's going to decide whether he can pass or not. So we will see, and uh, hopefully there will be um, uh, following uh, interesting questions there. At this time, uh, if there is a discussion, the opponent and also the main supervisor may uh, take part of that discussion. And then, of course, the public will uh, have the opportunity to pose questions. And this is why it's a public defense. We will make it in that way that first we will allow people in the room to pose questions if there are any. And then secondly, we will uh, allow uh, people online to pose questions. Thereafter, the, the, uh, the first part of the defense is ready and the examination board will uh, recess and uh, discuss the uh, presentation, the, the thesis and the defense. Uh, to decide on a grade, pass or not pass. So, that is what's will gonna happen today. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn to the respondent and ask if there is uh, any uh, errors or forms that needs to be uh, corrected in the thesis. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, 
Thank you. Then I will turn to Professor Paolo Falaro and ask you to give a brief, brief introduction to the uh, area of research. Can everybody see the, the share screen correctly? So, okay. So um, today, today we'd like to talk, talk about, about or give a brief introduction to light field imaging. Uh, my name is Paolo Favaro. I am a professor of computer science at the University of Bern, and I um, lead the computer vision group. So images um, carry a lot of useful information about the environment, and one such piece of information is geometry for these surfaces. Uh, now, why do we care about geometry of 3D surfaces? Because uh, knowledge of 3D surfaces allows agents, just to speak in, in general terms, uh, to navigate safely in the environment by avoiding obstacles and by recognizing objects, by performing reasoning with objects, and by understanding their shape, their function, and how to interact with them. So 3D is a quite important piece of information. Now, if we take a single image, um, then we can get some information about 3D, um, but it's kind of incomplete. So it leads to a lot of misinterpretation. Indeed, for example, we cannot distinguish between a real scene, so the 3D in a real scene, and a picture of a picture of the real scene, which is flat. So one way to avoid um, or to limit, to reduce these ambiguities, is to use uh, multiple viewpoints. And this is a passive way, that is, a way that you don't interfere with the environment to capture this additional information. Now, there are many ways to uh, gather this information. One such example is stereo vision, which we have, for example. Um, but when we look at building systems that have um, multiple sensors, multiple cameras, then we don't need to limit ourselves to just two such systems. So we can go to arrays of cameras. Um, we can build them at a very large scale, like in this uh, setup by Stanford. And we can also build them at a smaller scale, like this one on, on, the, on the phone. Uh, or even smaller ones like this one from Pelican. Or we can even go smaller, and this leads to uh, systems that are called planoptic cameras or light field cameras. Now, we can find in the literature, um, sorry, in, in the commercial environment, um, quite a number of cameras that are sold that have these characteristics. Uh, for example, we have here uh, cameras from Lytro, uh, the ELU model, uh, maybe also the, the uh, industrial cameras from Raytrix. Um, but you can also find the uh, more consumer photography, even for professional photographers like Canon EOS 5D Mark IV and, and also subsequent models. Um, and you can even find it in some cell phones like this uh, some, uh, Galaxy Edge. Um, now, in particular, in these uh, models like the Canon and, and the Galaxy, uh, we can find a very, very special case of the light field camera, which is called a dual pixel sensor, uh, which is an extreme setup uh, that uh, has the basic foundations of light field imaging. Um, and the idea here can be illustrated quite clearly. So you have a sensor that where pairs of pixels, you can see here, two pixels have a single micro lens on top, and then one pixel captures the view of the scene from one angle, and the other pixel captures the view from another angle. Um, and, <clears throat> and so this is the basic principle that you can find in light field cameras, um, and in the case of Canon, is used mostly for an autofocus, a very fast and, and uh, quite accurate autofocus system. 
Now, more in general, light field cameras uh, have not just a single, uh, sorry, a pair of pixels under each micro lens, but they have more. Uh, so here's a setup that we built. Uh, it's a Hasselblad, it's a professional camera that's modular. So you can take the digital back out. And here we have a frame that uh, is custom built. And on top of it, here in the middle, you can see uh, the micro lens array, which is the essential component of a light field camera. And the idea is that each of these small disks is a micro lens that covers not just one, not just two, but maybe a, a, a square of pixels. So we can go typically between 15 to 25 pixels. Of course, there's no specific uh, choice, but different models range in these, these numbers. Okay, so now that you've got an idea of uh, what the light field cameras are physically, <clears throat> what can we do with them? So, um, well, there are many applications, of course, all the applications one can do with a single image, so a conventional camera can be covered, but on top of that, with a single light field image, now we can get a much more reliable depth estimation because we have observations from different viewpoints. But we can do more. Um, and uh, observing an object from different viewpoints um, not only gives us information about 3D, but also tells us how the surface of an object reflects light uh, from different viewpoints. And so in general, you could also aim for estimating the BRDF of, uh, of an object, of the surface of an object. Uh, but more, but in, in other general terms, you can say that you can gather all these images, all these data, and build a single texture reconstruction. So, and often you can formulate that as a deconvolution problem, or even a blind deconvolution problem. Um, you can also use it in particular for microscopy, and I'll show some examples, for volume reconstruction. This goes into the 3D deconvolution formulation instead. Um, you can also use it for fun. And that was uh, one of the applications for Lytro, that is um, something that is called digital refocusing. The idea here is that um, because you have all this information from all these different viewpoints, uh, now you can actually simulate uh, different settings for a camera. And in particular, you can simulate changing the focus uh, setting of the camera. So for example, you can take a picture of a scene and then later digitally change the focal plane uh, and reconstruct an image as if you took it from a conventional camera with that focal plane. And of course, you can simulate more, you can simulate uh, changing the aperture uh, and, and many other settings. Of course, you can use it for applications like segmentation, especially because now we can get the depth map. Um, and as I already mentioned, in the case of uh, the Canon models, um, this has been used for autofocus as one of the key applications. OK, so let me give a, a practical illustration of uh, some of these applications with some examples. So here is a light field image. Uh, where you can probably see, maybe the resolution is not high enough, that there is some kind of pattern going on in, in this image. But if I zoom in, you can appreciate this pattern much more. So maybe now you can see all these micro lens array structure. And each of the micro lenses, each of the disks, is basically taking a tiny picture of the scene with a slightly different uh, viewpoint. So you can see all these. Um, kind of repeated, but slightly with a shift uh, images. Now, given this image, as I mentioned, you can get the depth map. So here's an example of a reconstructed depth map from, from this light field image. And here, the depth is illustrated uh, with grayscale intensities, where bright means points that are closed, so the depth is small, and dark are points where the, the the depth is large, so it's far away. Uh, of course, you can also use it for the uh, complete image reconstruction, as I mentioned. 
Um, and you can also do what is called super resolution, that is you try to um, reconstruct uh, an image that has more or less the same resolution as all the pixels that you use. There will be some loss, but that's the aim. Um, and here's an example of digital refocusing. Um, these are not probably the best digital refocusing examples, but these are uh, images that are dear to me because um, these were the very first we captured with our system. So let me show you the digital refocusing. So here you can uh, move that focal plane from uh, the front to the back. And here you can see that uh, you can reconstruct different viewpoints of the scene. Uh, and of course, we can hang also horizontally and in any other direction. Um, light field images have also been used for uh, microscopy. Uh, so here is a prototype set up uh, by Mark Levoy uh, with relay lenses and all. And here instead you can see a more compact version. Um, and in microscopy, uh, the boy demonstrated they can reconstruct a whole volume. Uh, and the benefit of, of this is that you can capture even dynamic uh, samples, in vivo samples, basically, because um, the light field camera captures everything into one, in one shot, while other microscope setups, um, like light sheet uh, microscopy or uh, confocal microscopy, they, they, they operate more as a scanner. So in the confocal microscope, you scan one point at a time. In the case of the light sheet, you go one uh, layer, uh, that layer at a time. The nice thing about the light field camera is that you can capture the whole volume at once. So here's a captured image. If I zoom in, you can see all the micro structures. And here to the right, you can see instead uh, the reconstructed volume. And you can see, especially if you look at some of the, the structures, the 3D uh, configuration of, of the reconstructed volume. Um, we also recently worked in microscopy with the light field camera. And just to illustrate another important benefit in, in this case. So if you take a confocal scan, you can get the very high accuracy volume reconstruction. It takes time, however, 72 seconds. This is suitable if you just need to do a few scans, if you, if you have in vitro samples, so they are all fixed. Um, but then even with that, then you need to perform some more steps to reconstruct the, the, the original or, or the clean volume. So you need to apply some deconvolution algorithms to get this. So to the time, you go to 76 seconds. So we are in the minutes range. Um, with the light field setup, it takes 100 milliseconds. That is the exposure of one frame. Um, also, it's a highly compressed uh, data. Of having 100 megabytes, you have 1.7. Um, and then, if you use uh, deep learning, then you can train neural networks that take only 15 milliseconds at one time to reconstruct a volume that has pretty much the same accuracy as what you get with a control. Um, so, total time goes from 76 seconds, 78 seconds to in the 15 milliseconds. Now you can go real time. And so this opens up a very different uh, set of options, like having interactive and having a closed loop uh, type of microscopy where you can stimulate and you can measure uh, um, in real time. Um, now, of course, it looks all very easy. And uh, instead, it is not. And uh, today's presentation will illustrate, indeed, how uh, many challenges there are in working with light field data and how uh, these can be addressed. And here I want to summarize a number of uh, key challenges that I think um, are, are uh, the, the stumbling, stumbling blocks in working with light field cameras. 
Uh, the first one is modeling the image formation. And here you can go from using geometric optics to wave optics, uh, and they bring different levels of complexity, but also uh, different, uh, different computational models that have different efficiencies. Uh, then you have to deal with aberrations. Uh, the focus blur, um, effects like vignetting, um, I've not shown in the examples, but at the corners of the images, the micro lenses become more squeezed. Uh, you have aliasing problems, uh, especially when you deal with dark reconstruction. This is, uh, is an issue. Um, then when you capture color, uh, like with images, you have to deal with a bare color filter, so you have to do changes in the case of light fields, light field cameras, and we'll see quite a bit on this uh, in, in today's uh, thesis. And then you can have noise and hot pixels. Uh, I could mention one thing is, uh, if you take the loom camera and you look at a raw pixel, uh, a raw uh, image, then you will see that it has lots of hot pixels. Uh, which means that they use very uh, cheap sensors because of all the reconstruction algorithms and the redundancy in light field images that we don't need to be uh, as accurate. But you have to deal also with these kind of um, aberrations, or so maybe I should call them uh, image uh, disruptions. Then, in, in the fundamental step in, in light field imaging is the calibration and alignment uh, between the array and the sensor. Um, 3D reconstruction needs to deal with matching pixels, which is not easy because you have tiny images. And if you reconstruct in a different format, then you have to deal with aliasing. The fact that lambertianity is not always true. Um, and then when you aim for image reconstruction super resolution, then uh, you have to take into account that this depends on the depth. Uh, again, there is no Lambertianity uh, in, in a perfect sense. And when you deal with volume reconstructions, you have to deal with the issue that um, tissue is not perfectly transparent. You may also have scattering, and this complicates quite a bit the uh, reconstruction algorithms. So with this, I have covered a uh, bit of the context of uh, light field imaging. And uh, uh, I, I, I can um, stop here and uh, maybe um, if you have any questions or we can proceed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, 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 Professor Pablo Favaro. Um, for this introduction and enlightenment of that there are so many things that may needs to be dealt with when you're working on light field. Next we will turn to uh, Yong Wei Li who will uh, make a summary of his thesis. Please. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Paul Favalo, uh, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my defense seminar, and uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to summarize and present my work. And today's topic is about computational light field photography, depth estimation, demosaking, and super resolution. Uh, today's presentation will follow this outline. I will start with some background introduction of light field technology, uh, followed with the uh, knowledge gaps that we identified and the research problems in this field. And we will then focus on three specific topics in computational light field photography, that is depth estimation, uh, demosaking, and super resolution. And finally, I will conclude the work and propose possible future works. So we start with the background and context of our, of our work. Mm. Light field is essentially a 4D parameterization of the light rays, as you can see here. 
and it's using two planes, UV and XY. And UV to be the camera plane and XY to be the image plane. The idea of light field has been used to a lot of uh, consumer products as already introduced by Professor Polo. And here are also some examples, light field cameras like this uh, Lytro and Ritrix camera, also a prototype of a light field microscope. Uh, different from conventional photography, uh, the optical design of light field capturing devices can be various. And uh, uh, to the left, you can find a singular lens reflex camera, and uh, that we call uh, from now a, a conventional camera. And uh, the image it captured is a 2D planar image that you can see here. And uh, to the right here is an example of light field camera. Uh, where a micro lens array is uh, inserted between main lens and the sensor. Um, if we zoom in the captured image of, a, of the light show camera here in the, in the uh, blue square, we can find that it, it is capturing a lot of micro images and each micro image is captured by, a, by one micro lens. And uh, this elemental or micro lens image actually captures different angular information of the point of the spatial points. And the second difference, the image formation process uh, is quite different from uh, conventional photography and the light field photography. Uh, a conventional photography, uh, a conventional camera converge light rays emitted from a, from a single spatial point to one pixel on the sensor, as you can see here and this black arrow is our uh, object. And uh, each pixel corresponds to one spatial point. Um, and this can be described uh, with the in the matrix form as well, that uh, here you can find a projective transformation that is mapping this, uh, the 3D world coordinates, okay, here is in homogeneous coordinate system, to a 2D image pixel. And this projection matrix uh, is actually uh, the camera, uh, ca uh, camera matrix that is composed of uh, internal parameters, K, and external parameters, rotation and translation. Uh, however, uh, a light field uh, camera uh, is a bit more complex uh, than that. Uh, you can see here, again, as an uh, object. And this spatial point, for example, the top of the arrow, can be viewed from different angles and recorded in different pixels on the sensor. And actually, this micro lens array split the angular information and record it in the different pixels. Therefore, we can have more views, and actually, we need to consider more complex geometry as well. That is, epipolar geometry if we have two views, and uh, if we have more views, we even need to consider uh, multi view geometry. And additionally, as I said, a conventional camera capture only a 2D planar image that uh, here x, y is the image coordinates. And uh, a light field camera uh, or uh, the light field is consisted of uh, multiple views that not only x, y that is the image coordinates, but also UV that is uh, camera coordinates uh, or uh, different perspectives in essence. With all these differences in optical design, image formation, and scene capture, as a result, the classic image processing do not really uh, meet the requirements of light field uh, photography. Therefore, we come to today's topic, and that is also my research, uh, to introduce computational light field photography. And uh, we, uh, we consider both light field sampling and the image uh, processing techniques to boost uh, the performance of the light field. Research in uh, introduction. Uh, in, this, uh, in this section, I will pose the research problems as a consequence of the listed differences before. Okay, uh, as I stated in the previous slide, uh, there are various designs that can be used to capture light field. And one special design is the light field microscope. Uh, it is uh, um, because the microscopes are inherently capturing orthographic views that is quite different from the projected transformation that we described before. And also, uh, the scene is quite unique. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it is, this is a, a cotton fiber 
painted, uh, tinted with the fluorescent ink. And you can see it, is, it consists only one color channel. It is not, uh, it, it is only a red uh, threads. And uh, so it is mon monochromatic. And also you don't find rich seen structural information as in a natural image. And that poses a quite unique challenge to the depth estimation problem. And as a result of the image formation model, um, this difference we notice that uh, uh, conventional sensor-based uh, demosaking uh, do not really fit uh, the light field sampling model because uh, f uh, if we take a uh, de uh, conventional demosaking, uh, then we would interpolate based on the neighboring pixels. And therefore, we would create some crosstalk artifacts if we interpolate uh, across different elemental images. For example, this pixel and this pixel, they are actually captured by the different uh, um, micro image under different micro lens. And uh, also, uh, as I explained before, that this spatial point is actually recorded in separate, uh, in several separate pixels. Therefore, in some sense, if those pixels are of different color channels, uh, uh, filtered by the different uh, Bayer color, then we can actually save some computational power by just uh, uh, by just copy paste the color. Uh, and the research problem number three is that if a light field uh, is captured with a single shot, actually there is a spatial angular trade-off. Uh, because we need to consider, we need to balance how many uh, pixels should be record uh, should be recording a, a desired spatial resolution, and how many uh, pixels should be given to the to to record angular information. And then, the re as a result, the resolution is uh, heavily degraded on light field cameras. And then, uh, and if the scene is uh, 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 sampled with only one view, uh, with only one view. Uh, Actually, we find the minimal sampling distance quite evenly distributed. That is for the conventional camera. Or if we just look at one view here, here is the view. And if it's projected on the different depth layers, actually, the, it is evenly distributed, the sampling distance. However, if we consider multiple views, for example, these two, uh, two views, uh, both uh, if we back project them together to the object space, you can find smaller sampling distance than the minimal that we think if we only consider only one conventional camera. And that means there are actually some hidden high frequency information in the light field structure that we can consider both for light field camera or multi-camera uh, setup. So we first come to the uh, first research problem that is uh, uh, the depth estimation for the pro pro problematic scene of the light field microscope. Uh, microscopes are widely used in several uh, subjects, like uh, material engineers, uh, they have to analyze morpho uh, morphology or distribution of fibers and uh, observation of a cellular uh, structure in biology and diagno uh, diagnosis in medical science. And uh, instead of a flat image, light field microscope can capture the 3D structure of the scene and introducing uh, perspective changes and depth analysis to microscopic scenes. Um, here is a light field microscope prototype uh, built by Optics Groups uh, uh, in University of Valencia, where I went for a collaboration. And uh, as I said, it also poses uh, uh, challenges like orthographic transformation. It is different from the projective transformation, and also the scene is quite unique. And here uh, is the yeah the relay system here that I want to introduce a bit because we can't really put microlens array into the objective. Uh, th therefore, they put a relay system here, uh, and that is also uh, th this is the optical model of the above uh, light field microscope. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are experiencing some technical problems. It's not responding. Yeah, it could be yeah. But here is the same. <laughs> Sorry for this? Okay. 
No respect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So to continue, uh, because of uh, this also graphic projection and monochromatic sync uh, features, it is difficult to apply uh, correspondence matching in these images. However, an uh, uh, advantage of uh, orthographic capture is that it is straightforward to generate a focal stack out of it. Therefore, instead of uh, correspondence matching, we introduce a depth from focus approach. And the first step is to generate a focal stack. Uh, assume that we have two objects. Well, the first one is the blue triangle and also a green uh, circle along the optical axis. That the captured views are like this. And if we shift all the views inward to a reference view, shown here, by different shift amounts, we are actually focusing on the different uh, depths. And here, if we shift, then we are actually focusing on the behind green circle on the reference image. And here are some uh, experimental results that we get from this focal stack generation. That here are the views marked with uh, some coordinates and then this is the refocusing results that we superimpose different views on top of the reference view and the average t intensity. And you can see here this part is in now in focus and as the shift amount changes, now this part in focus, here in focus, and so forth. It is focusing on different depths. And then we perform uh, our depth estimation that uh, by maximizing a, a normalized cross correlation. Um, and that is by calculating a window based or area based uh, uh, normalized correlation between the refocused uh, uh, view and the all in focus view captured by the microscope. And uh, here are some results of the depth maps uh, for different views. On the top row, there are different views, and the bottom row shows the depth maps generated for each of them. And then we also include an occlusion handling uh, scheme to handle the occlusions. And that we call it a voting scheme. That uh, it actually represents a process where we use the number of views uh, which, we, which converge to one identical uh, point in the point cloud as a threshold to handle the occlusion. And if we select, for example, uh, v equals, uh, that is the uh, number of views, v equals to one, then we're actually not adopting, we're not throwing away any information. Uh, and if v equals to two, then it means at least two views should be converged to this spatial point, uh, to this spatial point for it to be registered. And as you notice, uh, as v increases, uh, actually, less information are kept on the point cloud, but it is more robust. And uh, yeah, and if we uh, decrease v, uh, we keep more information, but is some uh, it is uh, sort of noisy. And to summarize, our, uh, we propose a solution for the microscope depth uh, depth estimation that we use the three steps. Uh, first, uh, we uh, generate a focal stack, then uh, we use the area-based matching, and finally we use the uh, voting scheme to handle the occlusions. Uh, and the results are shown here. Uh, you can find uh, the left is the result from ours, and uh, the other two columns are results for, uh, from the comparison methods. That's in the first, uh, you, you can see the distinguishable scene structure in our depth map. And also, there is no hanging effects in our point cloud that we can find here. There are some hanging effects. That means, uh, actually, the occlusion is not properly handled. And, uh, of course, this depth map is less noisy compared with the others. Um, here is a lot of noise, and here the scene structure is not even kept. Uh, but uh, there is a limitation uh, of this work that uh, uh, we can only uh, apply this area-based matching on, uh, within the depth of field of the microscope, so that we cannot really go beyond the optical design 
optical design of this microscope to focus on something that is totally out of focus. Then the second branch of my research goes to the image processing problem of uh, the mosaicing. And uh, just like conventional cameras, uh, light field cameras or uh, other setups which can cat, uh, capture light field use CCD uh, sensor as well the, and uh, the uh, color filter array. Uh, because uh, for each pixel it can only hold one intensity value. So therefore in, in, in order to render a full resolution color image, we need to perform a demosaking. Uh, however, as I talked, uh, the, uh, classic demosaking uh, would create some crosstalk cross artifacts and also is uh, wasting some computational power. So we, we instead want to uh, perform our demosaking in the object space instead of based on the sensor pixel neighboring uh, or adjacency. So, uh, but there are also some challenges if we do demosaking in the free street, uh, in the free. 3D space that, uh, first of all, we need to understand what is the geometry of our scene or what is the depth. And uh, the second of all uh, is actually a 3D interpolation because you can find the spatial points scattered uh, like following the object surface but uh, 3D in the 3D space. That means you need some 3D interpolation. And also uh, on the different uh, depth planes, actually there are uh, different uh, sampling distance that you cannot really perform uh, you cannot really perform classic demosking which is based on a very regular pixel grid. So as a solution we propose uh, the layered object space uh, to, to handle all these problems and we first back project all the pixels in the 3D uh, in the object uh, sampling space and then uh, we split this object space into several different layers or several several depths that we project all the back pro uh, we project all the object points in the point cloud onto those layers and in this sense we keep the sampling adjacency uh, because we actually project those point clouds following its optical uh, path and also uh, this number of layers that we choose can be tuned to the depth accuracy that if the depth is more accurate we can use more layers to have a pr pr more precise interpolation and if the depth is erroneous then we can uh, use less depth layers. And, uh, and, the, and we perform inverse distance weighting on each of the depth layer uh, because as I said it's on even distribution. And uh, to summarize, our solution uh, is there is a depth as assisted demosaking and in the layered object space. And uh, here you can see our results. Uh, we avoid some crosstalk artifacts and because we avoid interpolation across different uh, elemental images. And also we save some computer computational energy and keep high fidelity information because some, some interpolation is not really needed. And uh, uh, here you see our results and here you see a light field toolbox which is quite often used for, uh, for the light tool camera. And th this is the comparison result and another comparison with uh, some state of art approach that you can see here it is quite fuzzy and again the toolbox and ours we keep the sharp edges here and also uh, on the flower texture that you can find and there's no duplicate or uh, crosstalk. Um, but uh, we achieve this uh, at the cost of uh, additional information that is uh, depth because this is uh, based on the depth or the scene structure, scene geometry. And now we come to the third branch which is the super resolution that I will introduce. Uh, yeah, the motivation is that uh, because of this one shot has uh, a spatial angular trade-off of light, uh, light field cameras and uh, the light field uh, naturally captures uh, multiple, view, uh, multiple views of the same scene so it has rich scene content that can be used for super resolution. And 
there are some similarities between the demos king and the super resolution. The similarity is that uh, it is actually two aspects of the same problem, and uh, this problem is upsampling. And the difference is that in demos king, uh, the interpolation method is only focusing to recover the colors, but not high resolution details. Whereas uh, in super resolution, uh, the same content uh, need to be considered. And that's why the principle are quite different as well, that uh, the super resolution as other, uh, the, the super resolution is based on the principle of the patch recurrences in the natural images. Here I show example that if we zoom in this uh, red and blue squares, then we can see that they are quite similar and this information can be transferred to achieve some super resolution. Uh, however, uh, uh, and if we really zoom in like a, a five by five pixel window, then this patch recurrence is, is always is a certain thing because if we zoom in enough, then it's only line structure or edges that it will show and, uh, and we can learn across different patches. And to solve the uh, super resolution uh, problem for light field, we proposed a two-step scheme that, is in, uh, that involves in-depth warping and cross-depth uh, uh, learning. And in in-depth warping, uh, each view is taken as a low-resolution image. For example, if we put, uh, if this is our scene, and if it is captured by two, uh, by two views, for example here, and then each view is taken as the high resolution image uh, multiplied, uh, convolved uh, by the blurring kernel and then downsampled. You can see here image one, image two, and they are low resolution. Uh, and actually each low resolution pixel uh, induces one linear constraint on the corresponding high resolution patch. And if uh, there are enough uh, low resolution pixels, Corresponding to the same patch, then we have the we have the uh, we can solve this uh, high resolution image in this equation. And uh, if the depths, uh, if the estimated depth is accurate, and if we back project them uh, into the three D scene, then actually we can we can also or we can always find the patch recurrences because it is capturing the same thing on different layers, uh, uh, the same thing uh, on each layer. And this uh, similarity patch will be found and then that we can learn some warping model uh, on, this, on, the same, uh, on the same depth layer. And, uh, uh, but mm, there, are some, uh, uh, there are some cases that the depth is erroneous that we cannot really find a lot of uh, enough patch recurrences on each layer, on each depth layer. That's why we introduce the cross depth learning. That is a supplement to the in depth warping. And uh, the back uh, and if we back project uh, this this uh, scene back to the object space on different depth layer, it's actually a very natural scaling phenomenon happening here. That uh, it is resized to different scales. And uh, if we employ some approximate nearest neighbor search, we can find high resolution, low resolution patch pairs uh, across different layers. And then we can learn uh, from the high resolution uh, patch to fill in the low resolution uh, pair. And then by this, by doing so, uh, we, uh, we are actually migrating the fine details that we find uh, from another depth layer to the current depth layer. So to summarize our solution is that we propose to super resolve the light field in the object space by first by projecting the pixels to the object space. And uh, it, is, uh, in, uh, it has an uh, in-depth warping scheme and a cross-depth uh, cross learning. And the results are shown here. And, uh, uh, here is the, uh, here is our results, and here is by cubic uh, interpolation, and uh, LFBM 5D that is a state of art and original uh, image that you can see here is quite blurry on those lines, and we are sharper, but uh, we introduce some noises 
Actually, this is because um, that we actually, f uh, when we do this cross, de uh, cross uh, depth learning, we are actually faking some details or learning some details that we migrate to fill in the meeting information. And uh, uh, but the benefit of our uh, method is that we don't require external training data set or heavy pre-training computation. And also, uh, compared with optimization-based uh, super-resolution, we don't really have a lot of uh, computational uh, energy to consume. And here, uh, our last work considers a joint problem that is of uh, depth estimation and demosaking at the same time. Because actually, uh, when we perform depth estimation, we want as much information as possible, including uh, the color pixels. But on the other hand, we also proposed a, a demosaking approach that used the depth as a prerequisite. So there is a conflict. And if I show you this a classic image processing pipeline that we have the raw data and we first go to pre-processing that it, for example includes uh, demosaking and then we get color light field and uh, uh, some depth estimation super resolution as post processing and then feed them into different applications. Um, this sequential pipeline actually gives us a, a trouble that uh, which one should we do, do first? Because a good demosaking, as we introduced, need some depth information, uh, where a depth estimation also would require a high uh, color uh, uh, would require color images. So if we can't do this within this classic pipeline, then how do we uh, how do we solve this problem? That's why we come up with the solution of uh, CGMDD, which, we, uh, which is short for a collaborative graph model for demosaking and depth estimation. And we use the Markov random field to uh, solve this conflict and model the depth color interdependence explicitly with energy function. And here uh, in this uh, pre-processing block is actually uh, following the classic uh, pipeline that we perform demosaking first and then we estimate uh, some initial depths, and then they are fit into a joint Markov random field for optimization. And uh, we use the color, uh, we use the, <coughs> the, data for, uh, data, the data term and the sm smoothness term uh, to explicitly describe this interdependence relationship. And here, uh, this uh, uh, PICD uh, is the joint uh, probability that a pixel i is assigned uh, with color uh, intensity C and depth D at, at Z at the same time. And in essence, this data term describes how reliable an estimated depth is based on the prior knowledge of the obser observation. And uh, the smooth term is uh, composed of uh, a weighting term and a uh, uh, and, uh, and a smooth uh, and a, uh, a similarity score. Here, the weighting term is actually called uh, according to the gradient uh, we derive from the color. And this similarity score actually uh, gives us uh, um, a measure based on the color and the depth differences uh, that we want. This, if there is a huge difference, then we don't really enforce this smoothness. And as a result, uh, um, here we show the demosaking result. Here is the ground truth color image and uh, it is then uh, demosaked by different methods and this one is ours and to the bottom row you can see the color difference image and uh, the, it shows how much difference is there between the demosect and the ground truth and also here is the uh, results for the tr uh, for the depths that uh, we in our results is quite clear and uh, this depth estimation uh, methods don't perform really well because we are using the same uh, initial color that is demosaked by the live view toolbox and that gives you a lot of erroneous information that I introduced before. And so the significance of this work, uh, we solve this color depth dilemma and we challenge the sequential pipeline by a joint solution. So we come to the conclusion and future work. The main goal of uh, our research is to provide solutions to different light field processing, including pre-processing, post-processing, 
and some joint uh, uh, solution. And this has been achieved uh, in the follow uh, in following works that in our microscopic depth estimation, we investigated the diverse light field capturing systems that one of a uh, very special one is the microscope. And also there are challenges regarding depth estimation. And in our Demosikin work, uh, we investigate image formation model and how it will influence uh, some other processing of the raw light field data. And in our super resolution work, we investigate the inf influence of depths on um, post processing of the light field data. And finally, in this uh, joint Markov random field framework, we investigate uh, the influence of depths on post processing of light field data. Uh, so, the future work. Uh, okay, uh, so there are a lot uh, left to be done and a lot of interesting future works that with the layered object space, we can verify its uh, ability because I introduced that this layered object to handle the depth ambiguity or depth uncertainty. And we can verify it with the commercial range cameras like LiDAR and other cameras and this could be interesting. And also, because we model, because we perform the most scan or super resolution in the object space along the optical uh, axis on different depth layers, then we can actually encode different optical aberrations on different uh, uh, scene structure. On different, uh, 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 we can model this actual opt optical aberration along the uh, when we proje back project those pixels. And finally, we can also model the BRDF because we consider different angular sampling and we test the view synthesis that uh, can be, uh, can be uh, used uh, to our layered. Uh, that is actually an extension from our spatial super resolution that, uh, to the angular super resolution. And also to Markov random field work, um, we can incorporate different uh, properties of the to into this framework to introduce uh, different prior knowledge of the thing. And also we can improve the performance of the Demoskin and depth estimation uh, with some adapted energy terms. And uh, we can uh, uh, consider a combination of uh, maybe uh, the color and the super solution instead of uh, color and uh, uh, depth. Uh, uh, we, we can combine depth and uh, super resolution and just like we combined uh, color and uh, demosaking. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Young Wei. Uh, this uh, finalizes your presentation and the introduction by the uh, Professor uh, Favaro. Uh, we will now take a, a two, three minutes break. The uh, uh, um, streaming on YouTube will end now and uh, the, uh, um, the defense will continue in a couple of minutes uh, with a discussion between Professor Favaro and uh, Young Wei Li. So in um, two, three minutes we will be back. We'll just re rearrange a little bit here.